Paul, whenever we try to really discern what it's all about, we always get back to the laws of physics, the laws of nature. And most would impose that as fixed and final on the universe. And therefore, the hint, and it's only a hint, that some of the most fundamental laws might have changed over the course of universal history, which is not sure, but is so startling and disruptive. How do you look upon the laws of physics? Uh, are, are they necessarily constant? For a long time, I was an ardent Platonist. Now, Plato gave us the notion that mathematics has real existence, but it's not an existence within the universe. It's got its own sort of realm outside of right. space and time. So statements like 11 is a prime number or um, an equilateral triangle, these are, are real statements and objects, but they're not real in the universe. Uh, uh, physical universe, uh, if you try to draw um, a triangle or a circle in the physical universe, it's always an imperfect representation of the perfect real circle that exists in this platonic realm. And most physicists who work on fundamental issues uh, have taken on this yes. sort of platonic view, and they regard the laws of physics as mathematical statements existing in this platonic realm, where they can be perfect mathematical statements, infinitely precise. And that Mother Nature, who applies these laws of physics, does her computation in this platonic realm and not in the, the real universe. And the relationship between mathematics and physics has always been a very curious one because, as Galileo said, the book of, great book of nature is written in mathematical language uh, and so you have to be uh, versed in mathematics to interpret it. Uh, why is it that the laws of nature are mathematical? And then we can ask, well, why those laws? Why those particular mathematical statements and not some others? And so we have this image that mathematics is a sort of vast warehouse of uh, mathematical forms and relationships and Mother Nature goes along with a shopping trolley mm -hmm. and says, oh, I'll have that differential equation there and I'll have that symmetry group uh, from here and mm -hmm. I like this particular geometry there and then goes off and builds a universe uh, with those uh, concepts. Making the laws of physics from those perfect ma mathematical forms. That's right, and then leaving all the rest of it behind, you see. And so uh, uh, this raises the question, well, why did Mother Nature choose those particular forms and not some others, and uh, gets us into all sorts of mischief. Um, so that is the traditional view, mm -hmm. that, that the universe came with an absolute fixed universal set of perfect mathematical laws, immutable, stamped on like the creator's mark at the beginning, and unchanged ever since. Uh, but I've abandoned that uh, notion of physical law. I think it's uh, ridiculously idealized. It can never be tested. We can't ever show that the laws apply to infinite precision. I think there's very good reason to think that these laws uh, are uh, limited in their fidelity. And the reason is that the laws of physics are really informational statements. They tell us things about the universe. Uh, they give us information about how nature uh, operates. And when we go to the modern concept of information, we find that um, it's related to things like computability and uh, software and all of these things that we're familiar with from the information revolution. Uh, and so if we think of the laws of physics as being really like information or like software, uh, then uh, as everybody knows that any man-made computer is limited in its computational power. There's always rounding errors and uh, inaccuracies and certain finite uh, fidelity. In the same way, we should find that the laws of nature are subject to similar limitations. So that opens up the possibility that if the laws have a certain intrinsic uh, fuzziness, uh, might we detect some flaws in the laws? And could these flaws in the laws be more important than the laws themselves? And it also opens up the possibility that maybe these laws uh, can change with space or time. And so we can start looking for evidence that the laws uh, may not be absolutely fixed, but may uh, undergo some, some variation. Uh, and we can again imagine two types of variation, a systematic variation uh, or an arbitrary, a sort of chaotic uh, variation. Uh, now these are very unfashionable points of view, uh, but I think that the notion that the laws are absolutely fixed and infinitely precise, because it's untestable, is one that we should uh, uh, approach with a lot of caution. Well, it is testable in the one sense, is it could be falsified. You, That's right. You can, yes. you can never prove it right, right. but you can falsify right. it if, for example, if we show in the early universe the fine structure constant, a ratio of various fundamental uh, 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 forces and, and, and uh, 
uh, uh, laws in physics uh, ha has changed for some reason. Hard to do, but that would be very significant. Right, and, and, and there are hints from astronomical observations that maybe some of these basic uh, constants of physics uh, are not actually constant, but have uh, undergone little glitches and, and things over time. Uh, but I uh, like to give a very striking example of where I think uh, this belief in infinitely precise laws uh, clearly comes unstuck. And uh, mm -hmm. it's a, a, an example that is drawn from uh, the realm of quantum computation. Now, uh, the, in quantum mechanics, you can have a curious property called entanglement. Einstein called it ghostly action mm -hmm. at a distance. And what it means is you can have two particles that may be physically separated, but they're entangled uh, in a way that uh, means that if you do something to, to this particle, that particle uh, knows about it in some sense. You can't uh, use it to send information uh, or signal faster than the light or anything like that, but there's a, a linkage between the two. Now, the significant thing here uh, is that um, the more particles you add to this entanglement, um, the more complex this system becomes. And it turns out that if you have just 400 entangled particles, um, the complexity of that system is so great uh, that you could not specify the state of the system, uh, even if you used every atom in the universe uh, to uh, represent a particular number. Uh, there is no way that within the resources of the universe, the informational resources of the universe, you could even say what that state is. Now, it's just 400 entangled particles. Now, you might say, well, will anybody ever produce a state with 400 entangled particles? Well, the answer is in the quantum computation industry, where they're trying to harness the complexity of these states to do computing, uh, they set their sights on 10,000 sure. entangled particles in the foreseeable future. Uh, so this is not uh, totally unreasonable that we're going to hit a real cosmic limit uh, in the informational fidelity or computational capacity of the universe within a few years. And we'll see a breakdown uh, in, this, uh, in these laws. Because if you believe that quantum mechanics is going to continue to apply according to the present set of rules uh, to a system with more than 400 entangled particles, it means that Mother Nature isn't computing in the, in the real universe. Mother Nature is computing in this platonic realm outside of the universe. So it's a, a real test that we could find in the foreseeable future. And in one sense, all the particles in the universe are entangled in some way. Right, so if we think of the, the entire universe as a gigantic uh, quantum computer. But the significant thing is that the, uh, when we talk about bits of information, anything that you and I can observe uh, are not these uh, qubits, these quantum bits, not this entanglement. We see uh, cl real classical bits. Right. And so uh, there's um, a huge reduction that takes place whenever uh, you perform a, a measurement or observation in quantum mechanics between this uh, vast complex system with all these many branches of the wave function, as we would say. Uh, so you're describing 400 entangled particles. It has 10 to the 120, 10 to the power 120 branches of its wave function to describe it. And that's more than there are bits of information in the entire observable universe. Uh, but when we make an observation, this collapses down uh, to, to uh, bits of information. So the, we never actually see these quantum bits, but if you believe, and this is the, the key point, uh, if you believe that there is a sort of hidden platonic reality manipulating all these branches of the wave function, if that's mother nature at work, uh, then you have to be a, a Platonist. <laughs> but what are the implications if indeed the constants of physics are changing? Well, if the constants of physics are changing in a systematic manner, you can always say, well, there's a, a deeper law of physics that describes how they change. Uh, and so you're, you're back to square one. Okay. But if they're changing um, in, a, in a random or chaotic or an arbitrary manner, uh, then it would suggest to me that these are um, flaws in the laws rather than uh, some sort of uh, underlying super law. Would you call Spain it a flaw or, or a limitation on the precision of the law? Well, if it's changing in, a, in a, just an arbitrary way, I would expect it to be changing uh, throughout time. You see, the evidence from the uh, uh, the astronomical observations for the so-called fine structure constant suggests that it went through a sort of glitch about six billion years ago. Uh, whereas what I'm talking about is um, a fuzziness of the laws that starts out quite great. So if we could uh, glimpse what was going on at the time of inflation, just after the Big Bang, we'd see that there was very considerable fuzziness and that it sort of focuses in over time. 
So this arbitrariness gets reduced as the informational capacity of the universe grows. Now, where it is most significant is, of course, uh, in the very early universe. That's where there's the greatest amount of flexibility or looseness in these laws. Um, very difficult epoch for us to observe. But it's not inconceivable uh, that this um, uh, fuzziness in these laws will have left an imprint on the early universe, which is observable by us today. Uh, and indeed, the very process of inflation itself, which involves exponential expansion, uh, already uh, involves numbers which are in excess of the total information content of the universe at the time. And so uh, there's a self-consistency argument that I think can uh, be used to test these ideas, that we should find that there are uh, remnants or relics in the universe uh, from this very early time when the laws were less precise than they are now. What are the implications if indeed the laws of physics are, are imprecise, as you've said? Well, I think the implications are that we can, uh, if you want the real deep philosophical implications are, that it opens the way uh, to a universe which can explain itself and explain its own laws. Because if the universe comes with a fixed set of laws, infinitely precise, right from the word go, uh, then why the laws are as they are is, is a mystery. You've got to appeal to something outside the universe to explain it. But if the laws have got some flexibility, then we open up the possibility of a feedback loop between the processes going on in the universe and the laws that give rise to them. Mm. Uh, so we're, the traditional relationship between laws and states of the universe is a very lopsided one. The laws are fixed and absolute, but the states of the world can change with time. Uh, and however violent the physical processes that occur in the universe, the laws matter not one jot. Uh, you can't change them at all. Uh, so the states of the world depend on the laws, but the laws are completely independent of the states. Now that's another theological position. That comes from monotheistic theology, uh, that the universe depends for its existence utterly upon God, but God depends not at all on what goes on in the universe. Uh, and so uh, once you get to the notion that the laws uh, are flexible and the states of the world are flexible, uh, uh, then they're the symmetry between them has been restored and you have the possibility of a mutual explanation. The laws explain the states in the way that the states explain the laws. So you have a, a self-consistent explanatory loop. Without need for anything external to that, whether it's multi-universes or whether it's God. That's right. We don't need to, uh, to say, well, it's a mystery and so it'll all be explained by something outside the universe, but we don't know what it is.